Now, my pastor said, John, just be yourself. That's not very good. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, I'm anticipating something in the Holy Ghost tonight. There will be miracles that will happen in this place tonight. Not because I say so, but because he says so. And uh, God always confirms his word. And if I've ever had a word from God, it's right now. And um, so we're going to take a moment right now. I wonder if you just bow your head and close your eyes. The Bible says, repent ye therefore for when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, that your sins may be blotted out. Would you take a moment right now and just go before the Lord? Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive us of our sins, God, tonight. We thank you for the work of Calvary tonight, God. We thank you for your love and for your mercy, God. We thank you, God, for everything you're going to do, God, and everything you've done. God, we open ourselves to you, God. We ask you to forgive us of our sins of omission and sins of commission, God. We want to make room for you tonight, God, to move in our hearts, in our minds, and in our spirits, I pray, in the name of the Lord Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I am fully aware of what time it is. Uh, Bathurst is a long drive tonight. But I can tell you right now that I have been up uh, since about 4 o'clock this morning and through the night and stirred in the Holy Ghost with what I feel like the Lord has given to me. And I'm just going to relax. Praise God. Amen. And to help me do that, you should see your pastor on a pogo stick. I was going to bring a picture and have them put it up of us in the driveway doing a competition and being the competitive man that he is. I, do, I think he won. And uh, so if you ever get a chance to do something fun, ask him to bring out the pogo sticks. But it's funny we talk about reminiscing because it's how the Lord actually spoke to me this week. Um, he got me reminiscing and um, I'm on Tuesday and, of course, over the past few weeks, the Lord's been dealing with me about some things. And, uh, and I began to think just about everything. I thought, God, what am I going to preach? And because uh, we want to hear from God. And the silliest thing came up in my mind. And I'm just going to tell you the story. Uh, some years ago, almost 17 years ago, I married my beautiful wife. Hard to believe, 17 years ago. And, um, and I'm grateful for my wife and uh, grateful for her ministry. But while we were dating, uh, during the time of engagement, I remember Brother Carter sitting us down. And uh, have anybody had Brother Carter sit you down? Uh, I remember him sitting us down and... Um, He's getting nervous right now, but that's okay. And, uh, and I said, and he said, all right, if you guys are engaged, you got to know that people are, people's eyes are on you, especially if you're in the ministry. And uh, he laid out some ground rules for us to follow and thanked God for pastor's insight. Tonight, we'd be lost without our pastor. And, um, but I remember him making a statement to me uh, about while we were engaged, and it was this. If you're going to be spending time together, any amount of time together, you make sure you're in by midnight. True, isn't it? Did so. Wait till you hear the rest of the story. So one night, I never forgot that story, and uh, one night I was out, and uh, Eric and I were out till about 10 o'clock, and, and I thought, oh, I'm doing good. I think I'll go to the church and pray. Remember this story? You're listening. And uh, I went to the church to pray, and I thought, oh, I'll be okay. Um, so I'm just going to go to the church and pray. And she had to go. I think she was going away with her parents or something like that. And when she was, uh, after she left me at the church to pray, I stayed there till about 2 o'clock in the morning or 1 o'clock in the morning and, uh, <laughs> and um, never called pastor. Of course, at the time, I was living with them. And uh, it was a fantastic, we had some laughs, a lot of laughs. And I walked in the door, and the lights were all off, and I thought, oh, good, good, he's in bed. And I 
took my shoes off, and I think I might have got a drink of water, and I slipped down to go downstairs to the basement in the parsonage to where the room was. And you'll never guess who was sitting at the bottom of the stairs at the computer. <laughs> and uh, I said, oh, man, I wasn't with Erica. I was out. I was at the church praying. And uh, he said to me, it doesn't matter, John, because nothing good happens after midnight. And it's the appearance of being out past midnight. Midnight is what the Lord spoke to me. And I asked him, what about midnight? What about this hour, this, this time of night? The, the Bible actually quite literally talks about it a, num a number of times. But midnight is an interesting subject. I'm just going to start out by reading a scripture. It's a familiar portion of scripture in Matthew chapter 25. He said, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And while the bridegroom tarried or seemingly delayed his coming, they all slumbered and slept, every one of them. And at midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. And then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and for you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. Get your own oil. Put the effort into what it's going to take to get that oil. Buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they were uh, ready. They that were ready went with him into the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I know you not. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Can I preach to you tonight under the anointing of the Holy Ghost and with the help of the Lord, what about midnight? What about the hour that we're in right now? What about the day that we're in right now? Lord Jesus, I pray that you would have your way upon every vessel. God, that we would be willing vessels. God yielded to the moving of the Spirit. God, what happens in this place? God, it's determined by our response to your word. God, I pray that you would speak to us very clearly and very loudly, God, about the day and age that we're living in. And I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. 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 Hallelujah, Jesus. Would you clap your hands to the Lord? The Bible says in verse 6 that there were, in, in, the, in the verses previous to us, speak of ten people. All that were called to the marriage, all had the invitation. All were expected to be ready when the bridegroom came. Amen. But something happened with these individuals, these ten virgins or these ten ladies. Something happened to them that they dozed off and they fell asleep. And some of us have already gone in our mind to where we think this preacher is going tonight with the scripture that we're reading. Because we have read it over and over and over again. And we find ourselves reading the scripture over and over and over again. And it seemingly has no impact on us as we read that there is coming a day. Amen. When the five wise 
and the five foolish, amen, had to heed the call to make themselves ready for they were in an hour that they had never seen before. They were in a situation that they've never experienced before. They were in a world that they have never seen before. They were in a culture that they have never experienced before. And something in their lifetime caused these individuals to fall asleep and grow soft, amen, and unsensitized to what was getting ready to take place. But I've come by tonight to tell you that the bridegroom is indeed coming. And he's coming very soon at an hour when you think not the Son of Man is going to come. The Bible says, And at midnight was a cry heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. And all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And in an unexpected hour, the bridegroom came for the wedding. And the wedding party and all those virgins immediately began to prepare their lamps for lighting. They trimmed their lamps or they put their torches in order. They put their torches in order. It is a warning addressed specifically to those inside the professing church who are not to assume that their future is unconditionally assured. It is written to the church. All ten are expecting, expecting to be at the feast until the moment comes and there's no apparent difference between them. But in the moment of crisis and in the moment of the call at midnight, there is a dividing line that has taken place. Amen. And it's very clearly seen distinctly, immediately, that there's a difference between those that are ready and those that are not ready. Immediately. The Bible says, and at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And at midnight there was a cry. Everybody say there was a cry. There was a cry at midnight. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And at midnight there was a cry. In Jewish weddings were generally celebrated at night, yet they were usually celebrated at the rising of the first evening star. And so these virgins were experiencing a rather unusual delay, or so it seemed, that the bridegroom was not coming. That time was slipping by, and if he was going to come, he'd have come by now. And so we find ourselves in the same mentality. We never say it, but we live it. We live a life that says that the Lord is delaying His coming. We live a life that says that maybe he's not going to come as soon as he said he was going to come. The word midnight occurs 14 times in the Bible. It always is associated with some demonstration of the power of God, either in salvation or in judgment. The term midnight speaks of the moment when one day ends and another one starts. It is often used symbolically to describe a major change in our life experience. The first time we see the word midnight used, it appears in the Bible when the Passover feast was first observed in Israel. It was midnight when God sent the deaf angel to destroy the firstborn son in the homes of the Egyptian people. And at midnight, the Lord struck down the firstborn of each home in the land of Egypt. But the death angel passed over the homes of the children of Israel, sparing them because of one thing, the blood that was sprinkled upon their doorposts of their houses. It was at midnight at Philippi, amen, when Paul and Silas sang praises to God in the jail. And God's power was demonstrated by a great earthquake, which resulted in their freedom and in the salvation of the Philippian jailer. And the fact that the earthquake shook the foundations of the prison and opened the doors and broke off the prisoner chains without reducing the prison to rubble was a clear evidence that God was absolutely in control. It was at midnight that they seen the demonstration of the power of God. Amen. It was at midnight that they seen God set them free along with the prisoners that were beside them. It was at midnight that the apostle Paul performed his greatest miracle. He was giving his farewell message to the people of Troas in an upper room on the first day of the week. And he began to preach at evening time from the meal and was still preaching at midnight. Bring your snacks tonight. 
he was still preaching at midnight. And a young man named Eutychus was in the third story chamber up in the balcony sitting in the open window. And Eutychus fell asleep at midnight. At the hour of midnight, he fell out the window. And the Bible says he was taken up dead, at which time Paul went down and touched the dead body, and life was restored. There's a lot of things in Scripture that happen at midnight. Midnight refers to, amen, the end of a day, but it also speaks of the beginning of the day when the clock turns zero, zero, zero. Amen. It is the start of the next day or a new day. Midnight is a new day. The cry happens in this scripture in the new day. When it states that there will be a cry at midnight, in, at, after midnight or at midnight, it speaks of a new day. And when I look at the word cry, it was very interesting. I thought, well, what's this word cry mean? I don't know about you, but I do word studies. And in that word cry was the definition of tumult or grief. At midnight. And so I began to put it all together and I thought, what in the world is this talking about? What is the cry at midnight or the beginning of a new day? And you might be asking the same question and I'm glad you asked. Because at the beginning of a new day, Suddenly, we'll be in a new day. And there will be tumultuous times. And there will be grieving times. And there will be crying times. And there will be times of great trouble. Amen. The Bible speaks of such the world has never seen. Amen. The sign that He is coming. Amen. Is that the times get worse. And the times get more grievous. And the times get more tumultuous. That there would be a cry. And the cry would be that the days would get worse and not better. On the onslaught of a new day at midnight. Folks, we are in that new day. We are, in the, we are beyond midnight. Suddenly we have found ourselves, and I'm going to be one of the preachers that grabs it. Two years ago, suddenly the day changed. And a whole lot of other things begin to happen, young people, in our world that our elders would warn us of, saying that, the, that Jesus is coming back very soon. It is these events that are happening in these days that would have driven the elders to their knees to pray for hours, seeking the approval and the move of God. It is these times that would have taken the elders and caused them to cry out to God, making sure that the vessels that they have were full of oil, were full of fresh anointing, were full of the Holy Ghost power. Amen. That's so vital to us. Amen. They understood that the Bible said that if we have not the Spirit of Christ, we are not His. They understood, amen, that when He comes in order for us to leave the ground, we better be full of old-fashioned Holy Ghost anointing. We better have an old-fashioned anointing inside of us. They understood, amen, the times that they were preaching of were an event, Brother Carter, that was yet to happen. And I believe if C.B. Dudley were here today, he'd be looking at the times we're in and he'd tell the church, church, it's time to wake up. It's time to start praying. It's time to start seeking the Lord. Right. Amen. Times are not going to get any better. It's not fear preaching, it's truth preaching. Nothing's going to change. Nothing's going to get better until rapture. It's a powerful thing. Folks, we need the Holy Ghost. We need a good dose of the Holy Ghost. You know what? These notes are about as half as useful for the crowd, I can read them, but it's about half. I want to talk to you from my heart. I want you to lift your hand right now. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. 
Hallelujah, Jesus. Folks, just because it seems like the Lord's delaying is coming, it doesn't mean he's delaying. God has a calendar in eternity. Doesn't matter how imperfect or perfect you think you are tonight. Every one of us need to start searching the old heart and start making sure the vessel's ready. You can light a wick and it'll burn for a while. But when the wick burns up and there's no oil in the tank, the fire's going to go out. You can burn a piece of paper without any fuel on it and it'll burn for a little bit. But it lacks the source that needed to keep it burning. I am so disturbed by what I see these days. And if you've been like me the last two years, amen, you've read the news are the same headlines I've read. And then what's going to happen next? The Bible says that when they cry, peace, peace, there's sudden destruction. I remember when I was a kid, Brother Carter, I was terrified that I was going to miss the rapture. I was absolutely terrified that I was going to miss it. We're, in the, we're beyond the midnight hour, folks, and nothing good happens after midnight. Nothing good happens from this point on except for we're God's church. He'll come unannounced. He'll come as a thief. Jesus will return on an ordinary day when we're doing ordinary things. He'll return on a day when we're just living life. He'll return on a day when we say, oh, maybe tomorrow I'll get closer to him. He'll return on a day when you least expect it. One of the things that disturbs me in Scripture, there's a few things. <laughs> Number one, the door was shut. That's pretty definite. Number two, is the statement, I don't know you. That's scary. And all the stuff is scary, and all the stuff can be scary. But it's up to us to change that, because it doesn't have to be scary. It doesn't have to be something that we're afraid of. It should be something we're excited about. It should be something that lights our feet on fire. It should be something that brings us to a prayer meeting and seeks the face of the Lord. It should be something that reaches out to the Lord even when we don't feel like it. It should be something in us. He's going to come speedily. But the Bible says when he comes in Luke chapter 18, verse 8, will he find faith? Now, I like what the scripture says in, in our text that we read tonight. If we want to go to verse 6, sorry, verse 9. But the wise answered, not so lest there be not enough for us and you, but go rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Buy for yourselves. Revelation, or Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1. Isaiah 55, verse 1. It says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye and what? Buy and eat. Yea, come and buy wine and milk without money and without price. Buy. Revelation chapter 3, verse 17 to 18. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and am increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that the, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. 
if we're ever going to get oil in the lamp, it's going to take effort. Brother Carter can't fill my lamp with oil. The person beside you can't fill your lamp with oil. I was talking to my father-in-law, and we were talking about revival. And back in, he's mentioned, someone said, oh, I wish back in 1945, I wish we could have a move of God like 1945. When did God ever change? I've been in some pretty powerful services in this church. I received the Holy Ghost at prayer summit that this church used to host. And God has never changed. What are you willing to do? I was 16 years old. I'm just going to tell the story. Where's Naomi? Naomi's right there. She was in the youth group in Sussex with me. Remember, the, remember when I came? Amen, what a powerful time. Anyway, that following year, there was a prayer summit here. And I remember, man, I, was, I knew nothing. I went to Sunday school when I was a kid. And I remember feeling the power of God in Sunday school and growing up in Sussex. And when we had a powerful move of God. I remember there would be kids in the altar while we went back to our class when I was a child. I mean, there would be kids in the altar swaying in the spirit and crying and speaking in other languages. There would be kids laid out all over the floor. I thought that was amazing. But I remember, Brother Carter, my heart pounding out of my chest, knowing that that was the power of God that was moving. Amen. Because there was a group of people that set their heart to seek the Lord. And when I left Sunday school at a young age, because at that particular time, my parents stopped going to church and they stopped living for God. And I just stopped going because if your parents don't go, you might as well not go. I stopped going to church, but when I left church, that's what I left. So all I knew church to be and all I knew about church was that you'd get the Holy Ghost and you'd speak with tongues. And, and when you get the Holy Ghost, it's a powerful experience. And I never forgot that heart pounding feeling of the power of God that I felt in service, even as a quiet young child. Amen. My kids are quiet. My daughters, you can't get them to say boo. They remind me of me. I remember when I first went to Mary Machine, Brother Carter said, you were so intense, I had to get you to stop to smell the flowers. It's the truth. And I was so quiet and I was so timid. And I turned inward. And, but I always knew that the power of God is real and the power of the Holy Ghost movement is real. And I, I never forget watching people experience the power of God in church. And I said, I, and even though I was afraid of it, I wanted to experience that power that they were experiencing. And I remember watching people dance around the church backwards. Come on. I remember the days when people used to run around the church backward, lost in the Holy Ghost. I remember the day. I, I remember those days. Amen. When God used to move. I remember I was in the altar as a Sunday school kid. And I remember standing over to this side in Sussex. And down come Brother R.A. Beasley. And he walked down, and I was terrified because I knew he was coming for me. And he walked down off that platform, and he came right down to me. He said, young man, you lift your hands. And I said, okay. And I just shook, and I was terrified. Because I know what happens when the preacher laid hands on me. Holy Ghost was going to move. And I'll never forget that heart-throbbing experience. Never received the Holy Ghost, man, I wish I did. I wish I would have got a hold of this a long time ago. The only regret I have about this is that I wasn't in it long enough and I wasn't in soon enough. And I, the only regret I have is not seeking more of Him. And so when I came back, that's what I knew God would do. And I will never forget, where's Melanie Robertson? Is she here? She's not here tonight. She was there. As a matter of fact, so was Brother Robertson. And I was praying, and I, I said, okay, God, I, I want to have the Holy Ghost that I know that I could get. I want to have an experience in my life. I want to have the oil in my life because I know I need it in order to get to heaven. I know I've got to know that I know that I've got the Holy Ghost. I've got to know that there's oil in the lamp. Come on. I've got to know. And you can have a no-so experience. 
You can get the real Holy Ghost. Sister Faye Henry, she was here this morning. She used to say, I, had, I got the real Holy Ghost when I got the Holy Ghost. And I began to pray, and I went to Brother, Brother Dennis Munn at the time in, in Sussex, and I said, Brother Munn, I said, I got this dilemma. He said, what's that? I said, I need to know I have the Holy Ghost. He said, well, what are you willing to do? How, what cost are you willing to pay? What are you willing to do to seek after the Holy Ghost? And I said, well, I can go fast. I never fasted before in my life. And I started fasting, and I started praying. Man, the first day was tough. The second day was tough. The third day was tough. And everybody that says it gets easier after the third day, you're crazy. Because the fourth day was tough. It's the truth. Oh, fasting gets easier, brother, after a few. No, it doesn't get easier. Crazy. But I remember praying and fasting. And I was, and I was seeking the Lord because I knew I had to have the Holy Ghost. Look, just because you haven't got the Holy Ghost yet doesn't mean it's not necessary for you right now. There's a lot of people give up quite short of receiving the Holy Ghost. And they walk away because they never received it yet. And I know people that took years to receive the Holy Ghost. Listen, that's between you and God. God's got a plan and he's got a time and he's got a season when he's going to fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Young person, you've got to get a hunger in your heart for the things of God and the power of God. Amen. You've got to get a desire deep down inside you. Amen. That there's nothing else matters when I go to church but getting a hold of God. And I remember praying and fasting and seeking the Lord, amen, because I knew the Lord was coming back. Amen. I fasted and I prayed and I, and I fasted and I prayed and, and I drank a little bit of chocolate milk and drank some water because I wanted to. But I fasted and I prayed and I sought the Lord. I was so hungry for the, for the Holy Ghost and I needed to leave prayer summit knowing I had the Holy Ghost. I had to have the oil and the lamp because Brother Mum wasn't going to give it to me. Had to be the Lord. So one day went by, two days went by, three days went by, four days went by, the last day of prayer summit. I mean, I remember prayer summit. Powerful. We went to the Harbor Station, St. John Harbor Station, and uh, man, people were having fit. People were jumping and dancing and, and all that stuff, and it was awesome. And I wanted to do that, but I couldn't. And it seemed like on the fourth day, amen, it got harder for me to pray. It became more difficult for me to lift my hands, amen. There was something preventing me, amen, from getting a hold of God, amen. So I began to search my heart and lay aside every sin and every weight that did easily beset me. And I began to lay it all aside because I knew that I had to have the Holy Ghost. And I began to lay it aside, amen, and it got worse. And we were the last ones in that harbor station praying and, and, and seeking the Lord until the security. I wasn't leaving until security come told us to leave. And we left because security come told us to leave. And we got out in the car and we sat in the car. Amen. And, 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 we, and we sat down. And, and the next thing you know, the car started driving. And I was hunched over because I was so disappointed. Amen. That I never got the oil like I wanted to get the oil. Amen. Because I knew if I was going to get the oil, I had to seek it myself. And I had to set my heart. Amen. The Bible says to seek the Lord. And I kept on seeking the Lord. And nothing was happening and I was frustrated but I was more hungry than I was frustrated I was more thirsty than I was disappointed and I began to seek the Lord amen and seek the Lord and seek the Lord and that day that fourth day was the hardest day and that car started rolling out of the yard and all of a sudden I felt the brakes screech on and every young person in that car started praying in the Holy Ghost And I'll never forget. I mean, if you've got backslidden siblings and family, you need to pray for them. But my sister was sitting in the back seat, and, and the Lord spoke through her and said, You get your hands off my son. You get your hands off my son. Amen. I'm glad I didn't stop seeking the Lord. I'm glad I didn't say I give up. Amen. Amen. The Holy Ghost come in that car and God fill me with the baptism of the Holy Ghost that I am convinced that I have the real Holy Ghost. 
I never gave up. I wonder what would have happened if I would have stopped on the third day or the second day or even after the first day. Hey, man, you know what the problem is? Is We got this idea, hey, man, that God's a microwave God. Hey, man, whatever happened to seeking the Lord with all your heart, whatever happened to searching and feeling after the presence of God. I know your pastor believes in this. I know he absolutely is convinced of this. We need a good old-fashioned baptism of the Holy Ghost. We're living in the midnight hour. I was 16 years old when I decided I was going to fast till God filled me with the Holy Ghost, young person. I don't know why I'm drawn over here. I think they're just better looking. I was 16. And because I knew how God wanted to move and how he does move, I began to seek the Lord with all my heart. I overheard Sister Miranda saying to the young people, I'm going to embarrass them. I'm sorry. She said, last service, everybody seemed a little distracted. I want us to focus. Let me tell you something right now. Distraction will rob you of your oil quicker than you can blink an eye. Things that take your attention can rob you of your oil quicker than you can blink an eye. An idol can take your oil from your life quicker than you can blink an eye. If you've got a mentality that you can control God, then you've got an idol in your life because you make God after your own image. Listen, God works in His own way. And the Bible says we've got to seek Him while He can be found. Because there's coming a day when the door is going to shut. Some of us, the door shuts sooner. It doesn't matter how young or how old you are. Your door can shut before mine. I had a cousin who was just two weeks shy of being 16 years old. And I pled with her to come to God and get right with God and she wouldn't do it and I don't know where she is and I don't put anybody in heaven and I don't put anybody in hell. All I can tell you is this. Before she turned 16 years old, she was struck and killed in St. John. And we talk about the coming of the Lord, but the coming of the Lord comes sooner for some. And when the door is shut, you say, well, brother, I've been in church for years. I had an experience years ago. I'm glad you said that. Because there is a group of people called the foolish, that he looks at and says, I know you not. It's different than when he says, I never knew you. I never knew you means I never knew you. Never means never. But in this scripture, he says, I know you not. In other words, I'm no longer acquainted with you. That's scary. hope this is all right tonight but I'm going to tell you something right now we're going to be sitting in church and there's going to be a lot of people wishing they had tomorrow amen to get right with the Lord to get full of the Holy Ghost and power there's going to be a lot of people well we're all here together tonight I'm not naive enough to think everybody's ready to go because it didn't become apparent Until the call came, go out to meet him. It didn't become apparent until the door was shut. And every one of us have got to self-examine ourselves, amen, to see where we're at. Because we are living in the day right now where Jesus Christ is going to come back. Right now, this is the hour, right now. I want us to stand to our feet.
Well, I'll just wait for next service. I'll just wait till next week. I'm too busy right now. I'm too distracted. I'm too concerned about what I'm concerned about and not concerned enough about the Lord coming back. Say, well, I come to church, I lift up my hands. That's great. That's fire. But how's the oil doing? Listen, I, I've been there. I've been in that place where there's been no oil in the lamp. I know what it's like to be empty. And I know it takes a whole lot of guts to admit it is. I will never forget. I was going through something in my life where I grew distant from God. And I remember going to church one night, making a long story short. Sitting in the pew where me and my wife used to sit in Mary Machine. And I said, you know what? I don't care what's going on. All I know is right now I don't feel right with God. I'm not close to God. There's no oil in the lamp. And I said, I don't care if people know I'm a preacher. I'm going to the altar. Amen. Because I need oil in my lamp. And I ran to that altar. And I'll never forget this man come down and put his arms around me and set his hand, head on my shoulder and said, Brother Beach, the devil doesn't want you to make it. The devil doesn't want you to experience all that God has for you. Amen. And that night, amen, there was fresh oil begin to flow into the vessel. Amen. I'm glad for the oil tonight and we need the oil it's going to take guts to come to the altar and say brother that's me there's no oil on the lamp and I'm not where I should be we've all been there Brother, that's me. I, I want to get closer to God, but I'm distracted by video games and I'm distracted by media and I'm distracted by the, the media and my friends. I'm distracted by my family. I'm distracted by, by everything else. The foolish thought the wise were crazy till the rapture took place. Your pastor that preaches that you got to have Holy Ghost and that we're at the midnight hour and time's running out. You think he's crazy till the rapture happens. You think this preacher is going on about nothing till the rapture happens. Everybody's going to think the Pentecostal preacher's nuts till the trumpet sounds. You know what it looks like when you're looking for oil? The prayer room before church service is full. Young people, you want to know what it looks like when you're looking for oil? I'll tell you what it looks like. Your youth pastor come out of the fire. I remember they would pray in that little back room, amen. You'd walk by that room in there, Mashi, Brother Cody and Brother Mar and Sister Marissa. You'd walk by that room and you'd almost fall over because the Holy Ghost was moving so powerful in that little room where the young people used to pray. What was happening? There was young people that were seeking the oil because they knew they needed the Holy Ghost more than anything. What's it going to take to make us realize that God has never changed? That God's still the same God of past revival. He's still here today. Amen. The difference is, is our hunger and our desire and what we're willing to spend and what price we're willing to pay. What price? It costs you something. Oh yeah, no man joins the kingdom and doesn't count the cost. It's going to cost you something. I wish we'd lift up our hands all over the sanctuary. I wish you'd forget about where you're going after church. I wish you'd forget about the weekend. Just know I need oil right now. 
As significant as the midnight cry is the significance of the wise telling them, go buy for yourselves. What do you got to do tonight? What do you got to get rid of tonight? We all got something. What do you got to lay aside tonight? Because there is certainly a cry. There's certainly crazy times we're living in. And the Lord said he'd come back in a day exactly like this. Huh. Brother Beach, you sound like you got it together. I don't got it together. I just know. I just know that what the Lord said to me is nothing good is going to happen after midnight. And if something good is going to happen after midnight, it's going to be determined by how hungry I am for the move of the Holy Ghost in my life. It's going to be determined by how thirsty I am for the presence of God. And the revival that Joel speaks about, it can only happen if we're thirsty. Huh. Jesus. Hallelujah. I don't know if I was thirsty, I'd be in the altar. I'd be right in the altar, amen. Knowing I need the oil. It doesn't matter what anybody else is doing. I'm going to the altar. I don't care how bad I've messed up, what kind of mistakes I've made. It doesn't matter, amen. The God of mercy and grace is here tonight. There's an opportunity for you tonight. Come on. It's been a tough two years, but it's going to be a better year ahead of us. Greater things are in store for the one that's thirsty, for the one that's hungry for the things of God. Oh, let there be a cry go out. Let there be a cry go up to the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on. Let there be a fresh baptism of the Holy Ghost in this place. <laughs>